um, if we have a foster emergency um, or something that comes in and we need to spend the day with us because we're sedating for x-rays, um, we can house them in there until they're picked up and that way we don't occupy one of our critical patient kennels, which are usually pretty full. So yeah, and then right down this way. So we're kind of coming at it from the, from the back end. Um, this first room here is our cat exam room. Um, so our foster appointments um, come in through the lobby and then um, just again, like a general practice, are placed in an exam room typically. Um, oftentimes if we're too overwhelmed and don't have an exam room available, they'll wait in the lobby and we'll take the pet straight back. Um, but we do have these two functioning exam rooms where we can um, see the pet um, and also chat with those fosters or the adoptive owners that are coming in. So it's really nice. It's a quite a bit more formal than the old facility if you saw that, <laughs> the trailers. Um, so we're at the back end of the clinic lobby. Um, the clinic lobby is just right over there. Um, and this back end is just the desk that we have so lovingly mentioned ne needs to be manned more often. Um, and then we also have another, this is just another dog exam room um, for those foster appointments here. So we're going to um, delay a little bit because um, Dr. Rios is still going through her tour. But um, what questions, do you guys have any questions that didn't get answered or that maybe a smaller group setting would be easier to discuss or anything else I can answer for you. Why, yeah. Why don't they screen the cats for cat leukemia? Um, that's, that's a good question. I think because the test is so costly. I mean, we are trained um, as clinicians to sort of have um, an eye on certain cases. Um, so for example, non-healing wounds. If we've been treating a wound with antibiotics and it's not getting better, or if we see a feral cat that has a big wound that should have, you know, contracted, become smaller, we could see it was chronic and didn't. Um, we have kind of our eye on certain cases that might be more likely to have um, feline leukemia virus. Um, so it's definitely still something that's in our minds. We just try and screen um, a little bit um, because it would be extremely costly to test every cat that came in. So yeah, that's a good question though because it is, it is information that a lot of people want to know. If somebody is adopting um, and they're really set on having that information prior to adoption because they have other cats in their home and are conscious of that, um, we do um, often offer that as just something that we will do if it's a requirement for them before they want to take that cat home. Do, do they charge for that? Why? Um, that's a great question. I think yeah. historically we did not. I think lately it's been a conversation that we've been having. So yeah. That's a good question. Um, there's a little bit of a delay, but we're going to go in now. Um, I think that the other tour is left. So um, this is the official clinic space. Hello. So I'm going to have you all funnel in first, and then we'll chat a little bit. Um, so. Um, this first room that you see, this glass room here, um, this is our dog ICU. So this is one area where we keep um, dogs that are critical and need to be closely monitored. You can see we have kennels of a couple different sizes, but for our really big dogs um, that, um, that we have, we also have a whole separate area that I'll show you. Um, that area is great too for dogs that we want to be up and moving um, and that maybe aren't so critical that we need a constant set of eyes on. But this is great for those dogs that maybe um, it was a hit by car earlier in the day, we stabilized it, but we're still kind of worried about its blood pressure or whatever it might be. We can either have them out here on the clinic floor um, in a designated space for us to work with, or we can get them set up in a kennel that we still have access to see um, and our techs do as we're constantly walking past. Um, where you first walked in, that's a lot of our um, lab um, stuff over there. So we've got microscopes. We constantly are poking masses and taking cell samples and looking under the microscope to see what it might be, looking at urine samples, blood smears, and then we also have in-house diagnostics. So we have an in-house chemistry and an in-house CBC machine, um, and then a lot of tests we send out will include valley fever. Uh, respiratory panels, <clears throat> thyroid panels, other endocrine disorder panels. Um, but with our in-house machine, we can diagnose quite a bit. Um, so anything from a diabetic patient to a patient um, that maybe is suspicious for tick fever. We also have a variety of kind of immediate acting tests. So like that um, 
for example, with like feline leukemia, we have SNAP tests, but we also have that for um, tick fever in dogs and parvo in dogs, Giardia in dogs, and we house all of that in sort of the fridges that are over there. Um, so this is all primarily our lab work, um, but we have these brand new incubators that are just in time for kitten season, set up on those counters also. So the same space exists as a separate place for our cats. Um, so our cats are housed separate from our dogs. Um, and if you ever, um, if you ever pop a he your head in there, um, the soundproof nature of these rooms is pretty incredible. Um, we can also play um, classical music over the intercoms in both of these rooms, um, and um, over the general inter intercom in this space if we wanted to. Did you say these dogs in here are not contagious? Most of the time, they're critical, which you can be critical and contagious. A lot of times we're not dealing with just one problem, so that's still um, potentially a space where we would put something contagious. If we were worried about a contagious disease and a critical animal that we needed here, able to watch, what we would probably do is um, hang some sort of drape and information on how to properly clean um, gown and glove before touching that animal. But the great thing is, um, for our contagious animals, we also have a separate room, which I'll show you. Um, so if we're not sure on how contagious they might be, we're still waiting on results, that's a great spot to have them nearby, um, but not exposing these other sick animals. So um, we'll also use these rolling kennels. So if, again, if an animal comes in and we're not sure if they're contagious, while we're doing diagnostics, we can house them in a rolling kennel like this, and that way they're not touching the floor here or um, having any opportunity to sneeze in those kennels over there. When the public comes in and they want to see it, yes. and I see, uh, on some occasions we're told to gown up and yeah. dress them up. Now, where are those dogs, what areas can we go to and see volunteers with the public? I know yeah. we've taken people out that back door and shown them the outdoor portion the outdoor of it. The outdoor ones, which is mostly kennel cough. We don't yeah. Go up to the cages, but they get to see the yeah. So the only the only scenario in which the public is coming back to view these animals would be in a scenario where we're looking for an immediate foster for that animal, or it what came in as a stray, but there's somebody in the public who thinks it might be their animal, and they have to um, get a closer look and decide if it's truly theirs. Otherwise, this space that I'm showing you right now is considered separate from ISO. Um, and as far as which areas of ISO volunteer is open to volunteers, um, that's a great question. And I'll answer Dr. Wilcox. I'll ask that of Dr. Wilcox before our uh, tour is over because I'm not quite sure myself. So uh, aside from the outdoor area um, that you mentioned, they usually say staffers get a staffer to talk when you're busy, and they'll say, "Well, Cindy, you can do it." <coughs> Got it. Gown up and make sure they get it. Certainly, if you are going to do that, this is a great place to come for your gowning, gloving supplies. And um, we house all of those in the lab area there. And if you ever can't find any in the ISO area, you're welcome to come here first. Um, and we can provide that for you. Um, but again, um, as far as showing the public dogs, they should not be coming back here with a volunteer. There should be, have been some other level of communication where maybe they identified an animal as potentially theirs and are coming and we're aware of it. <coughs> Um, so again, um, cats are here, <coughs> how separate from dogs. Um, we've got um, this whole area, which we're still kind of working on organizing a bit, so that would be a really cool task for a volunteer, but um, just a lot of our overflow supplies um, on these shelves um, and in the drawers and um, hanging on the walls around these wet tables are usually the things that we need stat for an emergency. Um, so we've got um, like our ECG um, machine, our fluid pumps, that sort of thing, um, kind of all housed here, but then excess items and food and bedding all housed back here. Um, this is where all of our medications are stored. Um, so again, our technicians are not only medicating and caring for these animals in here, but they're also drying up all of the medications that we vets order for animals in the shelter and giving those often twice daily, um, sometimes just once daily. Um, but all of those medications are housed here and they'll go through and pull all of that as part of their, their shift. Um, and we're gonna kind of head this way now that I think Dr. Rios is finishing up over here. So these rooms um, are a little bit more under the radar. Um, we've got a locked pharmacy for our controlled substances, um, as well as our extra supplies that only doctors um, and the clinic manager can access. 
Um, we've also got a room for um, our TNR cats. So our feral cats that are part of the trap and release program um, that we need to um, either examine or usually they're here for alteration. Um, they can be housed in a separate room as well, um, separate from those cats um, and separate from all of the noise of the dogs and the other and the rest of the clinic. So that's really nice. Um, that room back there that you see, um, that's also another cat room. Um, so in preparing for surgery every day, what we usually do is um, we as doctors are required to examine every patient prior to surgery. Um, so whether they've seen the clinic before, whether they saw the clinic yesterday, we get vital parameters and a full physical done on every uh, animal before we anesthetize them. That way if there are any concerns, we can address those before putting them under anesthesia um, or we can decide they're not safe today for anesthesia. So while um, those animals are being waited, wait, uh, are waiting to be examined, cats are housed in that room, and then we also have a dog surgery holding area in this room. Um, so that's what those two rooms are for. Um, the center table kind of functions like a treatment area. Um, oftentimes, um, admissions will come in and say, hey, we've got this senior cat, and we're worried about his teeth, and we'll say, great. Here, hand us the paperwork and please get the cat set up on the center table and we'll often create kind of a line of, of what we need our technicians to do and, and what we plan to do. Um, so, And then occasionally some of our medical staff volunteer, medical volunteers will bring us candy, so that's what that is over there. Much appreciated. Um, these TVs are great. We haven't totally tapped into them as much as we can, but there's one here um, that we've started to use for training purposes. So last week we um, kind of closed down our surgery area and tried to kind of keep our triage area as quiet as we could for the sake of doing a review on anesthesia and CPR protocol. Um, so from top to bottom, how to do anesthesia, we went through all of that, even for those folks who've been doing it for years. Um, and we were able to use, utilize that screen to do a PowerPoint presentation. The screen in the back actually is designed to hook up to a microscope. Um, which we're still kind of figuring out, but when the time comes, what that'll do is it'll show what a doctor is seeing under the microscope onto that screen for teaching purposes. We get a ton of technician students. Um, we also get some students who are visiting from um, veterinary universities, whether they're out of state or Midwestern, which is up in Phoenix. Um, and that's just another great teaching tool. So kind of a really cool thing. Um, this is our radiology room. Um, so. We have digital x-ray. Um, we have a full digital x-ray machine that gives us images immediately. Um, and um, so those images are for review right away. Um, and then we've also got a separate digital x-ray machine for dental x-ray. Um, dentition is um, kind of its own ball game. So to get really tight little angles in the mouth and look at specific locations in the mouth, you have to have a separate machine for that. Um, and to my understanding, that had arrived um, kind of right before I had come or not too long before I got here and is a huge gift. So that's in um, the dental room, which I'll show you too, but this is our radiology room. Um, it's also um, specially designed to, when the door is properly shut, keep radiation from escaping out into the room and exposing those people who are not leaded or those animals who are not leaded. Um, so yeah. Uh, this is our <coughs> surgery suite. Um, so you can see that there are uh, multiple surgery tables. Um, because we do so many surgeries in a day, um, I'm, I'm the slowest of the surgeons um, since I'm still new. Um, and on an average day, I, I tend to do about 30, 35. Um, so what we'll often have is a team of technicians strictly for surgery. Um, these tables out here are prepping stations. So they'll give the patients pre-medication, which just sedate them and make the whole process of induction smoother. Um, at that point, when the patient, once the patient is sedate, they'll induce, get them on ISO gas, um, monitor their vitals out here, and make sure that they do all of the surgical prep that they can out here so that we can keep this space nice and clean. Often, um, surgery requires shaving fur away from sites, and that's dirty, um, and we want this to be as sterile as possible. So a lot of that happens out here. And there's this constant flow and cycle of animals, so that there's always um, an animal ready to go when you're done with surgery. So you'll finish up a surgery as a doctor, um, you'll um, change your, um, uh, your, your gloves, um, you'll change your equipment, have a new sterile pack, and you'll walk to the next, next table, and you do that you do that all day long. Um, other surgeons who are a bit more um, 
a bit more uh, advanced and well-versed than I am, such as Dr. Wilcox can do um, 50 in a day, and some of those are really complicated surgeries in the mix of our normal spays and neuters. So we do everything from mass removals to leg amputations. We do orthopedic procedures here. Um, we do eye removals when necessary. Um, sometimes we do plastic surgery. We've done cleft palate, cleft lip repairs. Um, we remove dentition, which is in a separate um, suite when necessary, and do dental cleanings over there. Um, let's see, what are some other cool things we've done? Um, that hernia that you saw on the x-ray that Dr. Rios had gone over where um, the body wall had been kind of destroyed by an accident. Um, we can repair that in surgery here. Um, a lot of times our like laceration repairs or wound repair type stuff, um, we'll do that out on um, those wet tables over there on the main center table. But for anything that needs to be sterile, um, we do do that in here. So sometimes emergency surgeries on the weekends, you'll find us in here too. Um, every patient who undergoes anesthesia has a technician who will be monitoring them from this point to that point. Um, and then once they're transferred to their kennel, um, at that point, um, they have um, shown that they're awake um, and they now have a separate set of eyes on them, which is either a technician um, or a technician student or um, somebody who's assigned to strictly monitoring them as they wake up. What they'll do is they'll ice pack certain region, regions if they were um, more prone to bleeding, that'll help them clock quicker. Um, they'll again monitor vitals until the animal is up and moving. They'll be the ones to notify us if a temperature isn't coming up like it should because anesthesia makes animals cold um, and so any additional post-op instructions that we need done immediately we have a whole separate team who will take care of that in the same kennels that they were placed in in the morning for exam they'll recover in those two um, so they all have their own kennel that they go back to um, at the end of the day Usually between 4 and 5 p.m. Um, is when um, fosters or adoptive owners will, will start coming to pick up their, their patients who underwent surgery that day. For those animals that are done later in the day, if we're worried that it's late and we want to watch them a little bit longer, we'll just have them come and pick up the next day. Or for some pretty major procedures, just so that we can continue monitoring them, we'll have them come pick up the next day. Um, in here we also have available um, our emergency CPR drugs. Um, anesthesia slows down the heart rate of animals, the respiratory rate of animals. It makes cardiopulmonary arrest a lot more likely to occur, um, though with close monitoring that sort of thing should be quickly caught and adjustments made to make sure that an animal is doing well. In the case of CPR, we have everything we need in there and then a separate set of everything that we need out here. Um, so just this week, um, there was a, a puppy who, um, who didn't respond well to anesthesia shortly after induction. Um, heart rate and respiratory rate went pretty quickly from normal to slowing. And so we actually performed kind of preventative CPR on that dog, um, which involved stopping the anesthesia, doing injectable drugs, a team of people placing an IV catheter in multiple locations, getting fluids going. Um, it's, it's a whole kind of process that happens and that dog actually um, came back and is doing well. So, um, so, uh, yeah, lots of really cool stuff happens in here. <laughs> so anything happening at night then? Does anybody... Um, um, so if they are seen overnight, so the same technicians that are managing our, um, our kind of critical inpatients, if the surgery team is leaving, which they usually do leave, they get here earlier, so they leave a little bit earlier than the triage team. Um, if they have a patient that's being housed overnight for additional monitoring, that then falls on triage. Um, so then the triage technician and the triage doctor are now in charge of monitoring that patient until they leave, um, as well as um, the next morning. So. Um, as far as patients that were really worried need hospitalization all night long, um, that sort of thing, you'll often see um, doctors or technicians take those animals home. So, yeah, <laughs> it'd be great if we didn't, if we if we had resources where we didn't have to do that. But um, usually, if, if we're worried enough, we're taking that animal home ourselves. So, um, this is our surgical prep area. Um, so Dr. Wilcox mentioned um, all of the packs that need to be cleaned and drapes that need to be made. So you can imagine going from this to this next surgery to this next surgery, you're constantly opening up new sterile equipment and new sterile tools for every surgical procedure that we do. Um, so this is kind of where that magic happens. We have our autoclave machines, which is um, a form of um, disinfectant, um, essentially um, antiseptic. Um, and then 
Um, all of our supplies for creating those packs are back here. Um, we've had volunteers who um, dedicate their time to doing that solely, which is wonderful and huge. And if you're interested in learning, there's plenty of people to, um, plenty of volunteers who know this well that can teach you. I mean, it's a huge, great help, especially for us surgeons, so that there's no delay. Um, in us waiting for a pack or needing a supply that we don't have um, and it just makes it so our patients are under anesthesia less too which is always safer so the smoother all of that can go the better for the patient um, back here is our um, dental suite um, so dental surgery is considered inherently dirty surgery because the mouths are dirty and um, so the great thing about having a separate space for dentals outside of where we do our other sterile surgeries is it's just making that space even more clean, easier to clean. There's not bacteria flying around from one dog's mouth while you're doing a spay on the table next door. Um, so this is only for dentals. That's all that we do in here. If a patient needs a spay and a dental, they move from suite to suite. Um, we have anesthesia machines in both. Um, and our technicians are trained to make that transition if necessary. Um, that's also where our dental x-ray lives. So again, we can take pictures and make sure, did we get the whole tooth out? Um, did we leave any little bit of root behind? Or is that tooth abscessed? That sort of thing. Um, and then back there are offices. Um, Dr. Wilcox has an office that she um, shares with a clinic manager and then <laughs> needs to be organized too. Um, and then, um,